All right, kia ora everybody. Welcome to the very first episode of Korero with Creators. Uh, this is the Moko Artist Edition. I figured for our very first guest, no one would be better than the man who gave me the Moko hair on my forearms for my 21st birthday, the very talented Te Honui Tuna. Welcome in, bro. Lovely to see you. Kia ora, brother. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, everybody listening, watching. Kia ora. I'm always being asked about moko, and I try to tell people that the answers lie with the very people who upkeep this tonga, you guys, the moko artists. So I wanted to give my platform to moko artists to hopefully, hopefully give some clarity regarding these traditions and to particularly focus on how they're affected by the age of social media and online spaces. So I really want the audience to see the variation in ideologies uh, as I talk to and interview many different artists. Uh, so absolutely be as honest as you can. So first things first, introduce yourself. Uh, kia ora. Um, yeah, ko te honu tuna tōku ingoa, uh, ko maunga pōhatsu, ko taiarahi a ngā maunga, uh, no te, mō ngā whārua o te waimana me rua toki ai uh, hau, uh, ko rārua me o te nuku oku marae, uh, ko ngai tūhoi tiwi, ko mātātua te waka, uh, ko hini mataroa, ko tauranga ngā awa, um, Sure. Kia ora, everyone. My name is Te Honui. Uh, grew up in a little place called Waimana, which is in the Bear Plenty here in NZ in Aotearoa. Um, I'm from Waimana on my dad's side and from Ruatoki on my mum's side. Uh, some of you may have heard of Tamietsi, who's actually my koro on my mum's side. Um, and I'm an artist. I grew up doing art under the guidance of my dad, who's an artist as well. Um, yeah, grew up rurally in a small town. Uh, loved it. Very lucky. Grew up at the river, at our marae, um, and I've been yeah, been doing art, art my whole life. My earliest memory is actually doing art when I was about two, two and a half, something like that. Um, yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, firstly, I would love to hear your definition or interpretation of moko. What is it to you? Yeah, so yeah, first off, um, just like there are many iwi and many hapu in, in Aotearoa, there are many, going to be many versions of this kōrero, so this will just be my own. Um, so don't out there take this and say, but that fella said, this is what moko is. No, this is just from my own experience and from what I've heard and my own interpretations of things too. But moko is uh, um, one of our many forms of um expression is Māori uh, one of our many creative expressions um it, it's super super deep like all of our other other forms um and it probably one of the most special things about it is it's the only thing that you take with you wherever you go can't be like stolen unless someone physically steals it you know steals it off you <laughs> um and it's uh yeah every now and then i'm reminded of how how special it is especially today with with social media and it becoming more prevalent and more um what do you say more obvious you know you know especially with people like yourself bro you know you have a huge platform and you're in front of thousands of people hundreds of thousands of people all over the world and it's um it's unmistakable you know and it's what i love about it another thing i love about it too is you look at moko and it's it looks like its own unique thing you know there are you know there are many polynesian art forms and so on and so forth uh but ours looks like ours you know and it's you know, pretty lucky um yeah yeah it's this is one of those those part you could go on all all day or night you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah i think for me like in its essence it's just one of our many forms of creative expressions as maori i really like, actually i've never i never really thought about it like you always have it like you said it can't be taken from you you know yeah Some people can take those other things but yep. moko cannot be taken that's yeah, literally right. everything else yeah <laughs> <laughs> except that um so you mentioned it a little bit in your in your introduction there, but what got you into doing moko? How did you become a moko artist? Mm, uh, my dad, my dad got me into it. So he was, uh, he is, still is a carver, and he was carving since before we were born, my siblings and I. And then um, there was a period around the early two thousands 
when some of my uncles and then some um some other fellas around th- their age from here actually in Tauranga Mona, uh through uh Moko Papa back home in Waimana and I was still in might have been primary school I don't think I was at high school yet and then my dad got into it through one of the uncles um so yeah it, it just became another one of those creative things that my dad did and I didn't think much of it to be honest because I was still young and you just want to be young and hang out with your cousins <laughs> yeah. and your mates you, know? you don't really pay attention nothing that your parents do seems special until you get older <laughs> you know? yeah yeah and then um yeah I turned 15 so he had already been doing it for a couple of years by this point and then he was doing some moko on my uncle, so his brother-in-law, and then his wife. And then the third person he was going to do that day was his sister, his younger sister. But she asked him if I could do it. And then, yeah, like up to that point, it did not even cross my mind to want to even get into it. Right. Because we would stretch for my dad and it would have been sucked. It was boring. <laughs> <Just stretching. laughs> and, um, he said, yep, if he wants to do it, ask him. And then she asked me and I said, yep. Bro, sweating bullets, shitting my pants, <laughs> yeah. didn't even know what to do. My dad was there, and it, it was fully in the deep end, didn't even know how to hold it, hold the machine, how deep the needle was supposed to go. So it was proper first-time experience. Trial by fire. Yeah, bro. And, and my auntie, <laughs> she didn't care about the results at all. So my dad did the design and everything. I just had to follow his lines. And he sat right next to me and just sort of um, guided me through the whole process um and then after doing that bro it was heaps of the cuzzies and some of the bros were asking to get done so i was tattooing my mates who were 14 15 like me and obviously their parents and our aunties and uncles were all sweet with it otherwise they would have said hell no (laughs) (laughs) they they let it happen and um yeah here i am now 17 years later yeah, and, and I would say, in my experience, one of the more noticeable artists that we have around with a very sort of, I would say, distinct art style, like people do pull me up in the street and go, oh, did Te we do your arms, you know? <laughs> and so it's always funny seeing that um, journey, eh? 17 yeah, years sure, from like, oh, to oh, now bro, having the off. cleanest lines in the game. That's the probably why. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting like this for the whole time. <laughs> it was ridiculous. What is your relationship with social media? Um, I see it as, uh, especially in today, because moko slash tattooing has become, um, I think, more of a business now, you know, because it's it's become like a, you know, really viable option to to make a living. And there are a lot of moko artists who make a good living of of uh, practicing this art form and um social media is how you do your marketing you know the thing about it is it's everywhere you know it's ubiquitous it's free um unless you want to go down the route of you know paying for ads and all those things um you know back in the days pretty much when i started it was just word of mouth or you would pay for slots and tattoo magazines. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, but now we're lucky. We sport for choice. It's just a matter of um, a few different, different things that go into, you know, obviously if you're a good artist, it makes it easier for people to want to come to you because they see the quality of the work. Uh, and two, you know, if, if you know how to work social media, um, you can get, even more eyes on your mahi. Um, so, yeah, I, I see it as a a necessary thing. You can obviously choose not to go down that route. I just think that <clears throat> probably two options left to you. One is a slow growth option, which is just word of mouth. People seeing your work out there, which can work. you know. And then the other part is it creates insane scarcity. You just think of that... Um, that old queer over in, uh, where is she? Asia somewhere, you know, who mm. tattoos in the mountains. Yeah. You know, like who? Yeah, 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 yeah. She doesn't have bloody social media, but yeah. she's got the world going to her. You know, and that's that scarcity thing. You know, people go to her to get five dots. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Um, she's obviously the exception, you know, to this rule. But I think, um, 
yeah, I like social media and like all things where, you know, all tools that are available to us, it can be used for good or used for, for bad. Um, and you can choose to see the good or the bad and, and opportunities. Uh, I think that comes down to, to the individuals. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. You know, cause it is, and that's what I always say. I always say it is a very powerful tool if you, uh, use it correctly and you know um it can be very beneficial to businesses and young businesses and, and exactly bro. things of the like so um how do you feel about the exposure or popularization of moko online right now like you mentioned earlier you know it's very in the forefront or it seems very in the forefront mm. right now and i don't know if that's because social media just allows us to see more people than we would walking around but yeah what are your th thoughts about it um Probably two two trains of thought on this. Like one, on the positive side, is it's good because our our art form is getting out there and it's coming from our own voices, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, and then probably the other side too is it's it's um it's easy for anyone to say anything, you know. So it's easy for the wrong information to be put out there, and because the majority of people watching, they don't know the difference. You know, they can't differentiate between what's right and what isn't. And like I said earlier, you know, um, each quarter from different areas is going to be different. So, um, yeah, bro. Yeah. I, I think mostly positive though, because it's, yeah. it's getting out there and it's, um, I've heard it sort of in the early days and especially more now, um, you know, normalizing moko for our kids and it's happening. You know, it's becoming so normal that um you know, in places like the East Coast here in Aotearoa, there are sometimes more parents and aunties and uncles with moko kanohi than there aren't. You know, right. so the kids are kids are looking at it and being like, Man, I can't wait to get mine. Yeah. You know, it, it, and I, I here's an example too, bro. I just went to uh Moko Papa a few weeks ago. And um, there were four of us moko artists working. At the end of the day, we uh, three of us, one of them had to leave earlier. Three of us artists got a photo with everyone who got done. Bro, and then it was only me and one of the bros who didn't have our face done. We were looking at each other like, bro, feeling pretty naked. <laughs> you know, so it's, that, that's happening more and more now. You know, people feeling... Um, yeah, you feel feel naked with without moko. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's one thing that I'd love to do one day, bro. It's just um, just a matter of time. And as an artist, then who uses social media to advertise your craft and obviously putting moko out there to the world as well, um, inevitably you must come across the negative side of the internet. Um, how do you approach that, both as the artist and inevitably a lot of if you're getting negative comments, it must be directed more towards the person receiving it, right? People are probably going, why would you do that? Even though, mm -hmm. and, but of course, your, it's your page um, putting others out there to potentially receive this for them to read later, you know? Yeah, 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 bro. It's, um, I don't know, maybe I'm just soft, bro, but I, I still learn how to deal with it now. Like I remember the first time I ever got a negative message it was about four years ago now. Bro, rocked me, eh? Mm. I was just like, far out. Like, how do I even deal with this? And like at the at the time, and still a bit now, you know, I, uh, there's parts of me that are like a, a people pleaser, and um, so when you see like negative comments, it's just like, oh, what the hell did I do wrong? Um, and what's what's becoming more prevalent to me, bro, is how there are people out there when you don't say exactly what they want you to say, how they want you to say it, they'll take it the wrong way, bro. Mm -hmm. And um, like an example is, uh, there was a, a few videos that I did, the Moko walkthrough videos. I did one yep. of your ones. Um, and there were two videos in particular, bro, and they were just getting a bit toxic. Because at, at the beginning of the video, I had a, that little disclaimer about not appropriating Maori culture. I think mm -hmm. like in hindsight, um, this is a good lesson for myself to be more precise with my language, to try and get exactly what I mean across to people. So there's no way of misinterpreting or mis, you know, misreading what I mean and my intentions. 
Uh, but yeah, bro, it was just people just going back and forth, calling each other racist and <laughs> yeah. what the hell, you know, this is blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, father, this, you fellas have missed the whole point of this. Yeah. That yeah. was just a disclaimer to say, um, if you ain't, if, if you shouldn't be doing moko, don't do moko pretty much. Yep. Like in its most simplest form. And it's a way more nuanced conversation than that. But that was just to preface the video, which was going to be me talking about my design approach to moko. And the whole thing was about, you know, why I design moko the way that I do. Yeah. And, you know, some of the thoughts behind it, just so people could look at it and go, ah, oh, I didn't realize that much thought can go into moko. You know, I thought it was just curly looking lines, you <laughs> yeah. know, and yeah, bro. So I, I think the whole message of it was, was being missed by some people who, um, yeah, who ruined it, but yeah. Yeah. So the, the lesson I take away, bro, is just, um, around precision of language and, um, trying to get clear about my intent for things. Yeah. It's the first thing I learned very quickly. Was <laughs> one word is off. And someone's gonna point it out and they're gonna go crazy about it but it's an interesting thing it was an interesting thing i wanted to ask because for me personally um and i've had a whole barrage of stuff with the sort of reach that i've managed to get over the past couple of years and for me none of it bothers me but that's because all of it's about me you mm. know it's all directed towards me and so I, I don't really care you know i'm relatively confident in myself but the, i experienced the very first example of it being in my space but about someone i knew and it was um lance yeah um and someone went off about how your artist must be crazy and all this and that and all of a sudden when it was about somebody else you know it was like whoa you know i don't want this in my space you know i can control how i feel about comments about myself but i can't control that about other people and so Mm. and then the other thing that i always get concerned about is you know if someone's going in there going, ah, oh, you got scribbles on your face. What have you done? You've ruined your life, blah, blah, blah. I don't care, right? Mm. But it makes me think then, though, that what about the, I don't know, 16-year-old who would love to get mukha when he grows up, but he opens up my comment sections and all he sees is, ooh, yuck, blah, 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 and all that negative stuff. Yeah. And, of course, human nature is inevitably directed towards the negative there could be a hundred positives like wow it looks amazing and then there's that one like ooh, ugly <laughs> and that might be all it take for that kid to decide he's changing his mind or something you know yeah. um, and, and i think that's really the one of the challenges of navigating um that online space is i can control how i feel and the comments don't bother me but Bro. it's oh, sorry, nice sorry, sort dude. of clicked in and was like oh wow but what about everybody else you yeah. know is that a thing sorry to cut you off is that a um like how you just don't care were you always like that or was that something you developed because i'd like to know um, that myself i would say i i remember distinctly i must have been around 15 or 16 and i i, I don't know what happened in my life i can't quite remember but i just kind of had this switch because you know growing teenagers teenagers are worrying about everything and what everybody thinks mm. and then one day i just kind of went who cares <laughs> you know mm. um i i'm happy with myself my far knows happy the people that are important to me care and their opinion of me is what i would like it to be right um and so it's a little bit different of course if it's people you know in your personal mm-hmm. life but once i'd reached this online space i was like I don't know these people at all. You know what I mean? Um, And then, of course, there's certain sort of step uh, stages of, like, absolutely don't care. Mm, Maybe. And for me, in the the space that I share online, it's non-Maori. If you're a negative commenter and you're non-Maori and have zero clue about our people and our customs, couldn't care less, right? Mm. Like, zero place to give your opinion, uh, negative opinions on these things um but then every now and then you might see someone who maybe looks like a a queer or something and on the facebook going what are you doing here boy and you go you know (laughs) because obviously i'm only young and so then and then there's a little bit more of a level of another care and then of course it's my actual whanau uh Mm. if there was a serious like sort of moment you know but for the most part it was just once i gained self-confidence in in who i am it was very difficult then to be upset by what other cool bro felt about me which has translated very well into the social space <laughs> oh can <laughs> you I imagine could, yeah very not quickly. having that self-confidence in the space that you're in oh, now, bro. Be... i can see 
you know, because this this is one of those job jobs uh, that you know you, you we heard about growing up, and it was coming into the forefront. Well, for me, of course, as a younger younger person, but um, once you're in that position, very quickly you realize how people can no no longer be able to do it. You know, they don't cope with it because mm. the the very first video I had that went viral to the wrong audience brutal you know like yeah. it's insane in those comment sections people say some outrageous stuff whether it's yeah. racist just hatred filled trolling of course um every now and then you get the odd sort of death threat kind of yeah. thing and that stuff would be intense if you couldn't handle 100%. it you know oh man and you know it's not just one or two in those big circumstances it's thousands thousands of comments of like you've ruined your life you're so ugly blah 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 whatever right and it's like whoa this would be crazy if you couldn't if you couldn't handle that you can yeah. see how it goes bad for people so quickly so it's been a it's been a it's been a thing i'm like glad that i had that ability prior to doing this because i would have been like Whew, i don't know how oh, long it would have lasted straight, huh? <laughs> could easily make you get ah oh, stuff this latest yeah you're for real so how do you feel then about creators like myself and others that have become, I guess, I don't want to use the word spokesperson, but that we've become uh, front facing in regards to moko. But ultimately, we are just kaififi at the end of the day. Mm. We're the people who get moko, not the ones who give moko. And so our knowledge is as limited to whatever we experience with you guys, the artists, on the mm. day. Um, be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, bro, with that, because um, there's there's a few, you know. I think with it is um obviously just the caution around court it all being different everywhere so but like yeah definitely share your own experience you know because your own personal experience is your own you know no one can say how your experience was to you and things like that or how it has been to you um i think probably where it gets um where the water gets a bit murky is when it's because there's definitely some things I think, and this is just my opinion as one of many moko artists, where I think should be left to moko artists to speak about. Um, obviously, that comes, that's in regards to like the practice of moko. Um, and, and areas like that, areas where unless you experience the giving of moko, maybe leave that to, to moko artists. Um, but any, you know, any of the sort of, general stuff you know and i put that in air quotes because that's mm. a very vague vague <laughs> term to use you know like a, around the basics of moko yeah far, go hard because it's mm. you know it's it's educating and um yeah i think always just prefacing each time you you share kōrero with this is just based off my own experience or this is just one of many versions of this kōrero uh, and one one thing I learned too is um, you can't tell other people how it is as they can't tell you how it is. You know what I mean? An example is um, certain designs in Moko, I've been told one or many stories about it. And I'm not going to let someone else from outside of my iwi or outside of who taught me tell me, nah, yeah, that's wrong. You know, it's like, no, no, you're not telling me I'm wrong. You're telling my teachers and my my elders that they're wrong. So, no, you know, this is our version of it over here in our small part of our country. Um, yours is yours. <clears throat> but, yeah, yeah, that that's sort of sort of my, my whakaaro around it. And because um, I don't know what it's like for you, bro. Like, does it, do you feel that, um, that pressure like you have to know with so many questions coming your way all day, every day? Well, for me personally, and I'm glad you brought it up because it is a question I always get asked is why do you always preface that at the beginning? I always say, this is just my experience, my opinions. Uh, also, I'm not a moko artist, you know, and hence why I, I decided to create this whole series was mm. because I was like, well, if I could get those questions, a lot of questions I don't answer or I just make a video saying, ask a moko artist, mm, uh, you cool. know, approach the artist, approach the people who have the knowledge um but i've noticed a, a positive comment i receive often is i often make videos when i don't know the answer to anything because uh, of course these days as well my contents become generally maori 
not just mm-hmm. football as it so much was in the beginning of when I joined. Um, but instead of not making a video to a question I don't know the answer to, like I'm doing now, I have the platform to find the people who do have the answer. Mm-hmm. So quite often I'll make a video going, I don't actually know the answer to this, but you know, I've got half a million people that there might be someone who does know or have a variation <laughs> or an answer and they can drop it in the comments, you know? Uh, and so this series is essentially doing the same thing, but yeah. it's putting face and word to it, you know? Um, because uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely don't feel pressured to, you know, if I, if I don't want to answer something, I won't answer it. Uh, or I'm also just happy enough to answer and say, I don't know. And mm, don't yeah, find that's it cool, bro. somewhere else, you know, um, cause you know, not everyone knows who, the moko artists are and i've made the odd video here and there being like here my moko artists that i follow go check them out you know mm. um but that's only one video where at least these sorts of videos can be broken up into many 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 videos and yeah. people can actually visualize these people and then hopefully go go their way and reach out you know um the, the ones where i really i don't make videos for but they're more often they're not dms anyway is questions that absolutely should be asked to you guys in consultation you know mm. people asking me like well we'll get to that later in the video i guess in, in in the conversation but you know things that i'm like this is not a conversation to have with me it's gonna bring you no purpose this is a conversation you have in consultation with an artist you know mm. so, um, those ones get no videos and they don't really get an answer they just get Find the more artists you like and take the questions <laughs> yeah. to them, you know. Yeah, cool, bro. <laughs> like, That's the one. <clears throat> people get confused, I think, because they see me with the moko and then they go, oh, he must be a guy that does it all, you know. And mm. I'm like, no, you know. And that's that trying to differentiate the difference between someone who's received it and the person, people who give it, you know. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's important that some of this stuff is shared online to bring education, understanding, therefore awareness and respect towards either moko or just Māori dum and Māori tanga in general? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I think what's why it's important is that um, it sort of opens the door a little bit, you know, into this world. And um, just my own personal opinion, you know, we can't, expect people to just know to just know how to approach moko you know especially for a lot of our own people you know because a lot of our own people grew up away from it you know away from from their tūranga waiwai away from their marae and stuff like that through no fault of their own um and i think it's a far better approach to be um i don't know soft and accommodating and and open and receptive to our people, you know, which is not to say you, you just let yourself get walked over, mm. you know, you don't let things get disrespected. You tell them how it is, but you don't make, you don't make it feel like it's an uninviting thing. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, I think it's cool, bro. Yeah. To, to open up the the door. And that's why I started those, um, my Moko journey videos a few years ago. Well, that, that was the, <clears throat> The seed of it was because up to that point, I didn't realize how many of our people didn't even know where to begin, mm-hmm. you know, and I just, because I had been around it, I just assumed everyone knows, which is what happens when you're just around things and mm-hmm. everyone around you is the same, you know, you assume that everyone's like that. So yeah. it was the whole idea around it was giving voice to people who, who come in and get moko and just sharing their stories around the reasons why they get it. Just so other Māori people out there could go, oh, man, I, I yeah. thought you had to have everything figured out before you even yeah. start this um, conversation with a moko artist. But they've shown me that you don't have to have it all figured out. Um, yeah. yeah, bro. And then, yeah, so I think that's social media is good for that, for opening the door. And then I think if you want to come in the door, that's when you approach moko yeah. artists or you go to... um people who have knowledge around it and you know you you educate yourself and it's it's a two-way street bro it's this is not a thing that you just come and just take you know you don't just come and get it and then get out of here you know you Mm -hmm. you come and sort of give yourself to it as well if if that makes sense yeah you're right in the sense about like opening the door and then if people wish to step further that's on them Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's one of the things i always try to iterate in my in in my content is you know because sometimes every now and then i'll get the someone going 
whether it's about Mukhul or Māori, the more in general, they'll be like, oh, but you didn't mention this very specific part of te ao Māori, tikanga, kawa, whatever, whatever. And I go, yeah, that's not necessarily for me to teach, right? I'm trying to give these people that absolute, as blanket, welcoming the introductory stuff, right? But if people want to deep dive into te ao Māori, that's on them, you know? Mm. That's for them to come into our space and learn or whatever about yes. you know that, like there's certain things and that's why i always say there's certain things that i won't share you know and it's not for me to share it's not on me to share the tikanga of iwi and hapu i don't belong to you know what i mean <laughs> but yet those iwi and hapu sometimes people belonging to them get angry at me for not sharing that stuff but i'm like i, that, I don't belong to that so yeah, that's, that's not for me to do you're right and right. that's right you know and and if people wish to learn further i'm giving them that i'm opening that door for them you know so mm -hmm. i try to keep my stuff very friendly and and open and welcoming and because you see too which is a good point about um and i had a question about that later about your moko walkthroughs or moko journey videos you know you, out of lots of the moko artists i follow i would say that those series that you do um i know lance does a few now with the puhoro stuff um <clears throat> they are very welcoming you know it's not often you see that insight into the moko artists processes um and you're right and it's helpful because it breaks down some of those misunderstandings you know like you said people go oh i didn't i don't, I don't have to have all this already you know i can just and which then makes people feel welcome and you know you've got a very welcoming and and friendly demeanor about the way you present yourself online too which i think because not everybody does and then that's where that the interesting um balance comes in with um how you see people's um approaches online you know cause mm. you have other people out there who share things but they share it from either a very staunch view um or an anti-certain group view or whatever yeah. which is fine and that's on their yeah. space to be you know um but you can at the same time you see how when you go to the comments how different those spaces are mm -hmm. so for mm -hmm. me i'm like well there's enough of that already you know <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm gonna i'm gonna hold a, a a friendly space and that's what i see in your mahi as well and online is that very um more open and, and mm. uh, yeah, thank welcoming you, space and so you touched on it very briefly earlier and this might be too personal so you don't have to answer but as a moko artist why yourself do you not have moko kanohi uh it's just it's just something that just hasn't happened yet bro it's um it's been on my mind the last probably a couple of years um and to be honest bro i just haven't prioritized it that's literally the only reason but um i look forward to getting it there and um frack gonna be all day yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah, <I> you're, <laughs> you're telling me <laughs> bro, i got this last year from my partner she did it of us like a little family portrait and before that it had been eight years before i had gotten any tattoos right. oh yeah. man it was freaking sore <laughs> bodies changed they <laughs> right. like through it and they only took like an hour if that and i was sitting there going how the hell can i handle my face if i get my face done <laughs> like shit obviously you know this is very um sort of low uh what do you call it sort of gravity behind it you know it wasn't like a huge like this thing that i had built up in my mind yeah uh, and i'm sure all of those things can factor into getting your your moko kanohi but yeah, bro, just a just a matter of time. I'd love to love to have it. And the funny thing is, purely on an aesthetic level, I'd look almost the same, bro, because I've always got a paho or a yeah. beard if you don't know <laughs> yeah, what a paho yeah, is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um because actually that's the one thing I, that did surprise me when getting mine was not that because of me personally, I've only only ever received moko. Like I, I made a decision to not get non moko mm. uh, on my skin um but the one thing i found about the face and it's not to say that the rest were insignificant um but there was a different kind of wider i guess maybe behind it like the spiritualness of it and this is coming from someone who's admittedly not that spiritual in my day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. but the whole process of it everything that lance went through on the day that i got mine done for about four hours, it took six hours. For about four hours, I was out. 
I was like in some, I was on the journey Tararohenga, you know, I was out there. I was like almost completely meditative. Mm. Where I was almost in no pain, which was so weird. Cause of course I was so like, yeah, it's going to hurt so bad. Um, and then it wasn't, I always say it wasn't, I got hungry about two hours to go and it broke my oh, break thing. Your meditative and that last two hours was hell on earth, <laughs> you know, and it makes me, but it, it was a very, very eye opening experience for me from a spiritual perspective mm. because I, there was no other way i could explain it because i was like i almost don't remember the first four hours you know yeah. the only part in my head that i remember is that last two hours where it really hurt and all of a sudden i was like oh my god this hurts so bad <laughs> um, <laughs> but so it's a it's a an interesting thing and i've had more since getting my face done as well and that hurt you know and i was like yeah mm. weird it, it was just different eh? just different just different and hard to explain for people who you know uh, listening tuning in who may not be maori and will hear about how important it is to us but maybe we'll never quite uh, understand of course and even i will admit i didn't understand until you're lying there on the table you know uh, mm, the you day have. itself the day itself was so educating you know you think you know and this is just as the i'm just gonna say the average joe you know i'm not like i wasn't super invested in learning more you know i'm not a moko practitioner mm. so my knowledge of it was relatively limited going into it and so the day itself was like huge you know you're like yeah of course you know um <laughs> And so to tie up this section then, do you think more Māori should have moko? Moko kanohi, moko anywhere? Um, I think if it's if it's their um, prerogative, yeah, for sure, bro. I'd love mm -hmm. to see it see it more. Um, yeah, this is another one of those things. Yeah, it's, it's super nuanced. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I will say this. I will say um, if you feel called to, to get it, go for it. Um, listen to those closest to you you know don't listen to don't let the whole blooming wider community dictate if you should get it or not you know if those most important to you say yeah you should get it then go do it um also it's a, it's a big role of a moko artist to sometimes um educate the whanau to help help them realize that it is okay you know because yep. there's a lot of um decolonization still going on in, in this space you yeah. know like like here's an example like one of my whanau members um still has the perception that you have to earn it and then i was saying no nah, no nah, like you don't have to but even then even if you had to earn it you've earned it more than enough times <clears throat> yeah you know so um yeah bro yep in a nutshell yes yeah yeah and that's why i i was try to phrase that as more not all because you're mm. right not everyone wants to you know and mm. that's perfectly fine not everyone wants to go through the sore of it yeah, little, yeah you know they might love it and think it's beautiful and amazing and everything about it i just don't want the needle part and like yeah. that's fine you know um and, and i'm glad you brought up um the role of, of the modern day moko artist as an educator for Fano as well because in a lot of my videos um if i don't answer it myself um, I do try to it, uh, advise people like, look, if you are asking family members, you know, be mindful, mm. <laughs> you know, use a little bit of critical thinking about what it is, what their history with mm. Maori dim in general, I guess, but moko is, you know, uh, and ultimately ask an artist because mm. they will be the ones that probably have the right answer uh for your situation you know because like you said i said you should be wary of um and it's that interesting thing which we'll touch on later but and that's why i, I myself can sometimes feel apprehensive about suggesting that because mm. i'm 24 right <laughs> yeah. and maori dim of course is rooted in the age hierarchy you know we have that whole concept of komatsua your elders are the the, the wisdom for your mm -hmm. people you know um and so sometimes it can feel a little bit um out of sorts to be a 24 year old trying to advise people on these things mm. you know? but at the same time we're in a different time you know we're not in pre-colonial times anymore we are in a time where my great grandmother and my grandmother never had moko because they were 
they belonged to Christianity or yeah. churches, you know. And so if I asked said elders, hey, Nan, what do you reckon? Uh, I'm not saying that this was the case for them, but yeah. as an example, um, and they go, no. Are they saying no from a Maori worldview? Are mm. they saying no from those introduced worldviews you know so i I always try to and so i'm glad you mentioned uh, Mm -hmm. remember that the artist can also help guide your journey because you know if you're if you're no one else in your family has moko kanohi i would be hesitant (laughs) yeah (laughs) like asking them whether you should as well because they clearly don't and the answer might you know obviously it depends but the answer (laughs) <laughs> might not be in your favor yeah, and it bro. might not be for the right reasons you know yeah no that's that's perfect because here, here's an example i'll give uh somebody uh inquired about getting muko and they're on their own uh journey of sort of discovering their taha maori you know their maori side because they never grew up with it and they didn't even know that they were maori but through some research they found out that they were maori um anyway this person wanted to get some moko and they weren't sure if they were allowed to get it or not because they didn't know enough about their Māori tanga or not. Um, and then their one of their parents said, "Oh no, you're you're not ready. You shouldn't get it. Blah blah blah. You should get it somewhere else, not in that spot." And then I, you know, I just she, she asked me these questions and I said, "Um, you know, your your parent is your parent, regardless of what I say, but just as a." Moko artist and someone who's been in this space for a bit, this is my opinion, you know, and you can take it however you want, you know, but just so you know. And then I shared some of some information similar to what you were just talking about, bro, you know, uh-huh. just around um Moko and you know, reasons people get it and how being moldy is enough and all of that sort of stuff. And then um yeah, this person ended up coming to get get done and it really was just it just helped ease her her mind and um yeah that that's one of the important roles of being a moko artist um and i say moko artist just so everyone understands what we're talking about like there's a mm-hmm. bunch of different technical terms you could use for it but um yeah so yeah bro i agree with you sometimes, <laughs> yeah. sometimes those closer to you don't know any better and that's not their mm. that, that's not their fault that's right and so uh, it's, it's nice to try and direct people in the right direction you know mm. So that's the first portion of my corded or done. So I wanted a portion of these episodes to be dedicated to the questions that I'm always being asked by my viewers. And hopefully over the course of this series, they will be able to see how much or how little variation there can be in the answers amongst the artist community mm. here. And hopefully break down with your answers some of the misunderstandings surrounding Uh, Now, there's a lot of questions, so your answers can be as simple as yes or no or as in-depth as you want. As we know, there can be a lot of nuance to these answers as Mm. well, so only answer what you feel uh, comfortable answering. So there's sort of three sections here. Uh, First section is probably for Māori. Is moko only for Māori? Uh, This is where we get into technicalities again. Um, And like I said, depending on who you ask, it might be different. Some people consider moko only for Māori and then kirituhi for non-Māori. And then some people consider all of it moko. Um, but I would say, like just for myself, yeah, I'd say moko only for Māori. Um, and I also, let me put this little caveat in there too. Um, Māori is not just a, a blood thing, you know. And I've got there are people that I know who have no Māori blood in them, but they were brought up Māori. You know, they were whangaued into Māori. So that they're considered Māori as well. So for those of you out there who are whangai, who technically have no Māori blood, but you're raised Māori, you have a Māori name and all of that, you're Māori, you know. Um, and this is just me, one random person, <laughs> and all of it, of Māori dim saying this. Um, and then kiritui for, for non-Māori or more more particularly uh those who weren't um who ain't moldy and weren't raised in moldy mm-hmm. yeah no that's cool and actually that's a that's a, a a new take on that variation that i haven't heard which is i should probably preface as well uh which i didn't do at the beginning that the for the viewers i guess that i would expect these answers are if they came to you as a customer 
right? Mm. These are the answers that they would receive from you as the individual, right? This is not speaking for everybody, right? Mm. So if if non Maori approached you and said, "Oh, hey, you know, can I get more?" You know, these these the way that these questions should be answered are if they were your customer, let's yeah, say. Yeah, cool, bro. Yeah. Um, so, ah, uh, is it tāmoko or moko or both? Uh, I use them both pretty interchangeably. I feel like um, saying tāmoko feels a bit more formal and then moko feels more uh, colloquial, like everyday language. Um. But yeah, I think both they're both both good. Mm-hmm. Do you have to have permission from your elders? We talked about this a bit before, but um, no. Uh, and again, this depends on who you are, where you come from, and what your whole situation is like. Um, if you have a good relationship, uh, and they know you, you know they'll be supportive of you. Sometimes people are unfortunate and they come from a whānau where they're not supported that well and their whānau and their elders will say no regardless. Um, yeah, so sometimes, no. I don't think you need permission from your elders. And that's a good point because I do get asked that a lot. It's saying, oh, you know, I'm Māori mm. uh, or, or I have a... One of my parents is Māori, for example, and say they'll go, but that parent's not in contact or, you know, yeah, not yeah. in contact with that side of family, can I still get moko? And you go, well, you're still Māori, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's not your fault that you're not in contact with your whatever parent, you know? So, yeah, exactly, bro. And, in, in like, if someone approached me like that, I'd find out more about their situation and then I can give a more educated answer on their specific situation. This mm-hmm. will change with everyone. Yeah. Do you have to be fluent in te reo Māori to get moko? Not at all. This is one of those things that... I'm sure most moko artists can agree on, especially all the ones that I know. No, yeah. Not at all. Do you have to get moko at the marae? No. And this, actually, this is a good point you bring it up. Um, it's become so, uh, what do I call it? So common now that I think a lot of people think that that's how it's supposed to be, uh, especially for moko kanohi. Um, when I get inquiries about people wanting to get moko kanohi done practically all of them um or most of them want to get it done at the marae because that's how they think it's supposed to be done and uh, for myself i personally prefer to do do it from my home studio because i i like to work intimately yep. my ideal setup for doing moko is just me and then the client and that's mm-hmm. it because I don't have to worry about anyone, especially because my studio is in my home. So yep. whenever you have visitors over, there's always that part of your brain that's thinking about hosting, yep. hosting people. And then the more people there are, the the more of your brain goes towards thinking about hosting them. Are they all right? All of that. Um, and I prefer to have all of my focus going into just the person who's in there getting their muckle done. Um, so no, you don't have to get it done at the marae. Yeah, and because I remember, because obviously I went to Lance's studio as well, mm. although he does do, he goes outward, mm-hmm. but um, it was one of the questions I got a lot when the video came up, I was like, what, why are you in like a studio, you know, and I was like, because <laughs> you, can, you can get it done anyway, you know, uh, do you have to stop drinking, smoking? No, Is not at all, um, <laughs> Swear. You, don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to change who you are to get muko unless you're an asshole, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're an asshole. Change who you are to be not an asshole, and then go get your moko, and then stay that non asshole person. Uh, one one of the the kōrero that I've learned in moko is um, whaianga mahi orarohinga, which is not word for word translation, but the essence of it means um, be a good person. And I think people know what being a good person is. Mm-hmm. You know, it means treat treating people with respect and um. Yeah, all of those sorts of things, you know. Yeah, so if you ain't an asshole, you don't have to change who you are. <laughs> <laughs> but it 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 doesn't hurt your um doesn't hurt you if you try and grow and try and become better. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great answer, and it's essentially what Lance said to me as well. 
Uh, not that I asked him, but he just kind of answered these questions anyway because he said, I get asked them all the time, so I'm just going to tell you the, the vibe. And he said, essentially, you know, you are now representing Māori. Mm. You know, the minute moko is on your face, you are all of a sudden inexplicably Māori. You know what mm. I mean? Like, this is it now. This is your calling card. Both positive and potentially negative, right? Mm. Depending on how you carry yourself. Um, and so when it comes to things like drinking and smoking and that, like, yeah, it's fine, but don't be out there, you know, being a knob head <laughs> in, and, um, you know, being too, too drunk or whatever and making a fool of yourself and being mean to people yeah, and being rude and disrespectful. Yeah, so exactly. It's, it's not about what you're doing. It's more about, yeah, that, how you, uh, <clears throat> Go out there, have fun, you know. But yeah, bro. It's not the, dick, basically. the smoking or the drinking. It's, no. It's the being an asshole. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's plenty of, <laughs> plenty of people who smoke and drink who are the best people. Yeah, plenty yeah exactly. Of people who don't smoke or drink who are the worst people. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm sure people are getting the pattern now, but is moko only for chiefs? No, definitely not. That's a straight up the guts, no. <laughs> Um, oh, this is a popular one. I don't know my fucker papa. Can I get moko? Of course you can. Um, as long as you know your Māori, obviously it's more helpful if you can learn more about your fucker papa. Because as uh, moko artists, we have more to go off, more information about you to go off. Because um, the more information you can give to us, the better. Short of telling us every single little <laughs> detail, you know, like I think it's all right if you don't tell us like how many animals your great 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 grandparents <laughs> right. had, you know? Like tell us the you know, the gist of the important your stuff. Papa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the most important stuff. Um but now you don't have to know your fucker papa to get it. Uh but I personally encourage people to to find out more about their fucker papa. And sometimes if I if I get like a nice vibe from them, I'll do it and I'll use it as a, a beginning of their the journey yeah. to rediscover who they are. <clears throat> and that's something I bring up quite often, you know, with all these things, whether it's Dareo, whether it's Whakapapa, whether it's general connection to Māori Dim, um, people have this idea that Moko is the end goal of mm. all those things, you know? Mm. And I'm like, for some people, it can be the stepping stone. You yes. Know? It's that, like, passport, maybe, <laughs> yes, into Māori dim, right? Like, it's going, I'm going to use this to mark this moment in my life. And from this moment forward, I am, like I said, inexplicably Māori. And my life is dedicated to Māori and whatever that entitles. So you, it's your life now, you know. Um, it doesn't have to be at the end. You know, the moko is yes. not necessarily... It can be, if you want. You know, yeah. that's up to you. But yeah. it also doesn't have to be for those who are like, I'd love to. And of course, again... This is probably a disclaimer. The word moko is not unique to this. So yeah. people receiving moko, it could be anything, you know. Mm. Uh, like I said, te we did my arms for my 21st birthday. Uh, that can be your stepping stone, mm -hmm. you know. It could be your anchor. You could get a yeah, ankle, exactly. ankle bit, whatever it is for you. And you see that a lot, you know, people's yeah. very first moko, something small, but it's significant for them. Because mm. like I said, it's that, it's that step in. Um, yes. And then from that point forward, the understanding like you said, you encourage them to find the fucker papa once they've done so. Yes. Yeah. Once you've made that step, your life is now a little different, and and the way you approach Maori dim from that point forward will be a dedication to Maori dim. Exactly, say. bro. Like here's a quick example. One of my friends was wanting to get her mukokoa done, and she just rang me for my opinion. Um, and because she was studying at the time, and she wanted to get it at the end of her studies, like when she graduated. And then she had a friend say, why not get it now? And then you've got it through your your journey and then you'll have it when you're, when you're graduating and all that. And I said, yes, exactly. You know, pretty much what we're just saying now. There's there's no one way to do it. Whatever feels, feels right to you, makes you feel more like yourself. Go for it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, does the moko artist have to be from your iwi or hapu? No, not at all. Um, for some people... They feel like they have to be, and uh, I won't speak for other iwi, but um, from my own experience, nah, they don't have to be. Sometimes, um, like if you really wanted to, you can make those connections to that artist, even if they're from outside your iwi. Yeah. <clears throat> um, this is probably the number one 
most asked question I get, what's your co-popper when approaching trans or non-binary, particularly when it comes to the traditionally uh, mm. perceived gender, gender specific moko? Yeah, nah, um, haven't even started that journey yet. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, I think this is one that'll have to be conversed with other moko artists. Yeah. It's a bit of a hard one to, um, it is. To make an opinion on just yeah. as an individual, uh, and I've yeah. I've actually had this this call it'll come up earlier too from a friend who was asking on behalf of a friend, um, and I just I just gave what info I did and just said ah, oh, not sure, but obviously with um, transgender call it'll becoming more prevalent, it's gonna eventually become more prevalent in the moko space as well i'm sure yeah um, but it is easily the number one most asked question really is, far out very very popular one um but yeah and i've said in the past i said i've heard so many different answers to this i'm not even going to answer it myself because, and so yeah. that's best left probably for the privacy of people's unique <laughs> things but i yeah. thought i'd ask it anyway yeah um this one's a cool one so this is just a chance for you to showcase some more artists as well and maybe later down the line you'll see uh these people he's talking about but who are your favorite moko artists and inspirations oh man yeah bro um one you've got them on your throat mano yeah. um and i'll share what i love about their mahi too what i love about his bro is it's um very clean and bold um i really appreciate simplicity and he's got a lot of like not like simple as in like ah oh, that's simple like anyone could do that but it's simplicity like tasteful simplicity i'll say it that way um i love uh Arodu arts he's um his his stuff is i remember there was a point when he went from here to like here and he just shifted gears and just went on his own tangent and I can see a lot of the influence that he's had. Um, to Moko, who's over in the Gold Coast. In my opinion, he's he's the best in the game at um, Moko Kanohi. And what I love about his Moko Kanohi is it's, it harkens back to like the old school Moko, like in the Goldie paintings and, you know, like old drawings of our tipuna yeah. and stuff. <clears throat> it reminds me of Moko like that. Um, my brother, uh, my bro, Uhi Wero, um, who's done my moko, all of my moko, um, for him is, it's been mostly around him being like a teacher to me, um, and really just learning about, like a lot of what I know, especially as an adult comes from him and, and the, like the, the wairua that I, I give off around my sharing of knowledge or my knowledge around Moko is, is from him. Mm. Um, there's a bunch, bro, but right now there's I'm so just many, drawing yeah, the blank. Yeah. Those are the, the top <laughs> Those of the... Those are some good ones, though. The top of the line, for Top sure, of the mind sure. ones right now. So how, for you, as the artist, how spiritual is that process of giving Moko for you? And does that or has that weight disappeared with time? Uh, so... Like for those out there, this might be random, but I think it's appropriate. Um, I'm personally atheist or agnostic, if you want to put it that way. So um, I think I still struggle with like trying to define spirituality. I think for me, spirituality right now is um, there's a few things to it. Comes down to like when you have those experiences that give you goosebumps i just sort of lumped that sort of experience into spirituality um like sometimes if i if i don't if i don't can't quantify things i'll just let it be what it is like i won't try and say oh, this is a spiritual experience or this is whatever um sometimes bro yep so so yeah. in that vein yeah sometimes experiences are like that um and sometimes they ain't, but it's become so, because um, I've done it for so long. Yeah. Sometimes it can feel just as normal as... Another day. 
yeah, as everything else yeah. that that I do in my day, you know, over the years, it's. I think it depends on um, sometimes the person, you know, or the quarter behind it. Like if it's a real heavy, heavy sort yeah. of uh, subject matter, or heavy heavy quarter that you're dealing with, um, sometimes it can require a bit more of your uh, attention and focus. And I think just that in itself can make it feel a bit more spiritual. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also the person, because like, it's, it's not just, well, not all the time anyway, it's not just you sitting with a person doing some moko on them. Sometimes it's being able to comfort their energy and um, make them feel safe, things like that. You know, because sometimes people have some real heavy, heavy stuff they're dealing with. Yeah. And whether they know it or not, you know, they can share some of it with you without even yes. asking you if you're willing to like take some of that on. Yep. And I'm glad that I've experienced the things that I've experienced through my life outside of Moko as well as in Moko that can help me sort of deal with that. with uh, spaces like that a bit more, you know, it could be a bit more accommodating. Um. So yeah, bro. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's mm-hmm. great because you're. It, it, it will be a different one depending on people's dif- differing levels of spirituality. Like, mm. so that's a good one. Uh, now we already talked about this, and so for anyone watching, yeah, the bro does have more walk walkthrough videos on his socials. But lots of people want to know what actually goes into your process when you turn up on the day, and because uh, as most people have learned through my content, moko is quite often drawn on the day. You know, yeah. Have, freehand in the moment kind of thing um so what goes how, how do you go about it yeah cool so before you even turn up we would have done emailing and i prefer to have email because you you're messaging a bunch of different people at the same time and so you've got a thread to go through just to refresh yourself on the conversation instead of a, over a call or something we have to try and recall and remember, remember everything you spoke about um so you go through email and for me one of the main things is just getting a vibe from you like if i can tell like oh yeah this is someone that i i'm willing to spend a day with or however long your walk is going to take sometimes you get like nah this person just they seem like they're a bit um a bit off or something and then i won't do them you know and that's the thing moko artists can decline you they don't have to do you uh and so once all that is all good bro and then get them to come in um we already know what it's going to represent where on the body how big and all of that and it's usually just quick, um, you know, just getting to know each other a little bit, how's things, you know, what you get up to in the weekend or whatever, just to familiarize yourself yeah. with each other and Break the just ice. to help them sort of settle in and relax a bit. And then once we've done that, uh, which can take five to 20 minutes sometimes, you know, if the conversation is good, um, I'll get them to jump on the table or sit on the chair wherever is most comfortable and appropriate. And then I'll just draw our design on based off their quarter and then once and then i have a look at it if they're happy with it um we jump into the actual tattooing process and then um yeah the whole the whole day you usually converse with each other get to know more about each other and you know you make it it's, it's a real light mood like it's not heavy at yeah. all for me anyway and it's um it's just like hanging out for a day really or a couple yeah. of days and then at the end of the day we you know I, I most of the time i'll take a video on their phone and i'll do a video of their moko and i'll point at specific areas and say this represents this this represents that and so on and so forth because guaranteed they'll walk straight out and it'll be gone they'll forget it well all. <laughs> i had that with with lance <laughs> yeah, exactly we, we spent bro. like 40 minutes and he was like boom 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 this 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 and it was up to that point as well it was the most Obviously, there was a lot of information mm. in regards to Moko Kanohi to absorb. And then, of course, you go through the six hours of basically out there. By the end of it, I'm like, what was everything again? All you know, like, it just goes. It goes. <laughs> you did answer it there anyway. But have you ever turned someone away and why? Yeah, I've turned plenty of people away. An easy way to get yourself turned away is to just come in and say how much. <laughs> yeah. Like, it goes a long way just having a small greeting. You know, it's yep. it's it's courteous, it's respectful. We're not um we're not faceless businesses, you know. We're we are people. 
yeah. you know, where, where people on the other side of their message are sending. So just saying, oh, keen for a blah, 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 how much? Yep. You get a no. Sometimes you'll get a block. Yeah. No explanation. <laughs> so you're going to have to figure that one out yourself. Um, sometimes I, I give people no's if I think, um, I don't know, if, if they just feel like they're um, really doing it for what I consider the wrong reasons, yep. which can include purely for aesthetics and just to impress. And you yep. get that from people sometimes. Right. Um, sometimes people want designs that their family member has done. And I'll say, oh, unfortunately, I don't do other people's designs. You know, yep. um, Sometimes people will be a bit too specific. They'll, want, they'll tell you exactly the shape they want. Um, where they want certain things represented, and right. it's it's it, uh, for me it it kills the the creative um, license. Yep. So for those people, when most most people like that, I just say thank you for inquiring, but um, I'm going to humbly decline. I don't think I'm the right artist for you, but I hope you find the right artist for you. Yeah. Yeah. Things that's like a good that point because that's a popular question. Is, is mm. oh, can can X do the design and then x artist actually do it or whatever whatever and I yeah that and you're a good example because that's what one thing i remember you saying is you know some people don't want to do that because depending it can be a little um i guess insulting or maybe yeah. disrespectful to the moko artist because yeah. the reason well the reason i personally pick certain artists is for their art right exactly. or their right. skill their style you know i don't want <laughs> So and so's other stuff. The really wild one is sometimes people go to a they want like sometimes the artist is not actually, I guess, tattoo trained. Mm. It's just a family who does more art. Yeah. Um maybe like myself, you know, I can do the artwork, but I don't yeah. actually know how to do the to the skin. But then some people are like, Oh, can I ask that artist for the design? But then this artist lives next to me, so I'll use them, you know, and you go, Whoa, that's like yeah, disrespecting bro. two artists. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's it happens often. Like um you get messages or I'll get messages from someone who's keen for a design. And I'm I'm always sure too to make sure exactly what they mean. Like, do you mean for me to tattoo it as well? Like the design and tattoo do the tattooing or do you mean for the design for someone else and sometimes i say oh i live in australia or whatever right uh, i was hoping that i could get the design of you and then get someone else to tattoo it here and then my my advice is um to travel whatever the distance is to the artist who can do both like yes I don't, it makes no sense to me yeah. other than obviously cheaper and quicker to go to an artist who can't even do the design for you Mm -hmm. like go to someone who can do the designing and the actual tattooing part of the process yeah. and i think too i uh, granted not that i've ever tried because i'm not an artist but in my experience you know other than tristan's stuff which is stencil mm. i couldn't imagine trying to put that on a stencil you know like <laughs> the way they look like that is because they're drawn on mm. freehand you know and and in my experience it's about that being able to put it to the body and yeah. follow those contours of the body is why it looks like that. If you drew that design and you gave it to someone, I guarantee it's probably going to turn out a little weird. 100%. Um, you know, not all <clears throat> on in person kind of thing. Yeah. And and I always, this is a personal co popper of course, and I do get it. There are financial struggles out there in the world. But for me personally, if Mukul's as important to you as it is to me, there's no amount of travel. There's no amount of money that could hinder me going to the people I want to use. Yes. You know, I traveled to you from up north. I traveled to Lance, all the way to Lance from up yeah. north, you know, and and spent whatever your fee is. Yeah. Not try, oh, how about Chuck, you know, come down a little bit, $500 <laughs> off, you know, which is why, and because that's probably the second most common question. That's not even in my list because it's not a question I think even is, is worth it because is how much you know how much yeah, does it yeah. cost? how much this how much that one there's variation in that too much depending mm. on who you talk to uh but also ultimately it doesn't matter yeah people, you know i think if if one you're supporting the artist it's at the end of the day it's someone's livelihood mm. but two if it's if it's truly that important to you yep. that number shouldn't matter you know yeah um, i agree bro i think the only then, importance you should give it is so it gives you a goal to to hit 
you know so you go all right this is the number this is how much i can prioritize saving so it means i can get to that number in six months or whatever yeah you know what i mean but not as a de- it should never be a deterrent thoughts on kirituhi can non-maori get it do you do kirituhi yes yep non-maori can get it i do kirituhi um and similar to what i was saying earlier like if the vibe is right if i feel like it's the respect is there and you can usually tell when the respect is there because they've they have to have done some sort of research, amount of research to even, to even get, get to the point where they're sending you a message. Um, and yeah, if I can, I can sense that that respect and stuff is there, then happy, happy to do it. And bro, I've, I've been lucky that most of the non moldy that I've done moko on, actually maybe all of them have been all choice. They've been all yeah. like cool as and respectful. And um, you can tell that, they it helps it in a funny way for some of them, bro. It makes them feel more like themselves. Um, I did this one fella, and our um our history is similar to his history, like in terms of their their people um being colonized and stuff back in the days, and so he felt. Uh, I don't know. It, it, my my sense anyway. It felt like the feeling that he got from Moko is a similar feeling that we get from Moko, you know, right. as Māori, which is cool, bro. I was like, wow, yeah. I was not expecting this, but yeah, yeah, bro, let's do and it. It's, it's interesting because like you said, you're probably, again, nuance, but the non-Māori who, the ones that approach you like like you said, the ones that have already gone far enough to realize that approaching you is the right way to go instead mm. of just going to any artist and pulling up a picture of mm. you, for example, and going, give me that. You already know they've reached a different, they've already reached a certain threshold of that respect. Right? Yes, Because bro. the people who don't care, they're not coming to you, are they? They're just going to go to any shop and go, give me that. Yeah. Um, and whereas, so there might be this interesting imbalance maybe in that you might find the non maori who approach for kiri he could be more respectful of you and your space than maybe some maori can right cuz mm, yeah, it might be yeah, a bro. different level of well i'm maori so you know you just give me this how much kind of thing you know yeah. but obviously the non maori who reach there they, they're already being as careful as they can because yeah. of course for non maori too it can be a big thing to yeah. um, especially in the current climate of of Lots of confusion surrounding Kirituhi. You know, mm. That's why that question's on there, because lots of people ask me going, can I get Kirituhi as non-Māori? And I was like, to my understanding, it's for non-Māori, right? Yeah. Um, but there are some Māori who say that Kirituhi is anything below the neck, you know? Like, it's mm. so there's so many different answers out there that um, I was like, I better throw it in there because it'll be important. And then following on from that, another very popular one, can other Polynesians get moko or do they get Kirituhi? Assuming they're just approaching <clears throat> from a general, not, mm. not ingrained in Māori them. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I've actually never heard that or even thought about that. I would say it's Kiritui because they're mm. still non-Māori. Yeah. Um, obviously, they're a bit more closer relatives to us. Um. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. say that. Yeah. And then you already answered this. Uh, and I was it's a unique answer, but I'm adopted by Maori, but I'm non Maori. Can I mm. get moko? Adopted by Maori, by Maori. Yeah, yeah. I I say um, you can get moko because like, in from what I've been raised with, um, there's not really a difference between Fangai kids and like blood kids. Mm-hmm. Like, your kids are your kids. Yep. You know, both my parents are Fangai. What it meant to me was that I just have more aunties and uncles and nannies and kuros who I, and I don't say like, ah, oh, they're not technically, you know, my, my parents, siblings or whatever, but they're still auntie and uncle. I just, they're just auntie and uncle, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm sure they think the same of, of us, you know, their nieces and nephews. So, um, yeah, if you're adopted into a Maori family and, um, that they, they've been your parents and you call them your parents, mm-hmm. Yeah, I say it's it's moko. Obviously, yeah. more nuanced. There's 
I mean, a million versions of the story. I'm sure they yeah, could yeah, be, yeah. That people could say, hey, but you see it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, this is different for every single thing, but generally, I see you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, the miscellaneous category, kind of. Do you also do non moko tattoos? Yeah, I do actually. Yeah. I just recently started doing them again, probably a yeah. few months ago. Uh, I do portraits. I do. What else do I do? It's mostly portrait, like realism stuff, and then moko. I can do other things outside of that, but I don't want to because it just does not interest me. Like there was a yep. point 10 years ago where I would tattoo everything and anything. Right. <clears throat> like I I had a period where all I wanted to tattoo was Japanese and I would right. not do it anymore. <laughs> this was a younger me where I didn't understand the, you know, cultural appropriation and all of that sort of stuff. I just yeah. saw it as an art form. Like some people see moko as an art form to just take and just do so yep. um yeah japanese was something that i used to do back in the day and i have a huge appreciation for it that's for sure i remember bro there was a point where i wanted to get like a whole back piece japanese um because it was i felt like i did more research into that than i did into moko yeah right you know but the journey that i've gone on where i've come back to now is like oh shit what am i up to yeah <laughs> right you know, and that's a perfect segue because the next question is a word we see a lot at the moment is cultural appropriation. So mm. when it comes to moko representation in pop culture media, and it's there's a lot of it at the moment. Uh, a good example, of course, is the Avatar movie was a big recent example mm. of that. Uh, where for you as the artist does that line between appreciation and appropriation yeah. uh, be drawn? Um Oh, yeah. I think th there are a few things that come to mind. I think um, respect and the, 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 the manner of which something is done and like consultation, like consulting Māori. And then even then, like that's a hard one. Like who, which Māori do you consult? Right. You know, there's so many and it, you can't speak for all Māori. No. I think it's uh, intent comes into it. Sometimes there are people who just straight up want to take um and then there are some people who appreciate it and they like an avatar um feel like they want to change it enough that it's not exactly moko but it's inspired by moko um for me personally i liked it i liked yeah. their their version of moko that they had on avatar it looked different enough obviously it was inspired by not just maori but you know yeah polynesia polynesia and, you know other cultures um and i like that our our people were in there too like cliff was in there yep. i'm sure we had um you know some of some moldy who were part of that crew and stuff we could see some who were like extras and things in there yeah um <clears throat> and yeah bro, this is an interesting interesting topic because when i was doing those videos where i had don't appropriate moldy culture i had one person bring up an interesting point that i never thought about and he said um it was along the lines of, but what about um, you know, like Maori culture isn't just one thing. It's it's a it's a it's a whole umbrella sort of term, and there are a bunch of things that sort of fit inside that umbrella. And he goes, there. I'm sure there are some things in Maori culture that some people would benefit from, like in terms of um, like leaving taking your shoes off at the door or. You know, like res respect yeah. is not sitting on the table and things like that. Yes. And then I, I was thinking about it. And I was like, oh, Father, that's very interesting. I never thought about aspects of your culture that you'd want people to take. Yeah. Because of, um, yeah, because it, it, it's a bit more respectful. It feels more respectful to people. So <clears throat> I think, um, yeah, when it's, uh, in regards, I'll speak just about moko. In regards to moko, um, if you're just taking it and just see it as something that it's like, oh, that looks That's cool. cool. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the world, let me do that. That looks like something fun to do. I'd say no. Um, but if there are people who can do stuff that's inspired and that's a uh, another thing word. too it's just like <laughs> where where do you draw the line exactly yeah i think it's a moment to moment thing um 
But if it's inspired by it and it looks different enough that it doesn't look just straight up like Muku, um, and it's, yeah, I think it's cool. I think it's cool yeah. when people take the kōrero and they see like the deep meaning that we can imbue into Muku, and they appreciate that aspect and they want to do that with their own tattoos. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with that. I think it it makes um yeah, it makes for more meaningful um appreciation of yeah. of different art forms, not just muku. Yeah. No, and, and I totally agree too, and, and you bring up a good point with um that understanding, you know, about understanding. And one of the things because I I had so many questions about the Avatar movie when it came out, you know, and I went, all right, I'm going to go watch it. But firstly, you guys should watch it, right? Make your own minds up as well. That's one thing I try to think, you know, you d don't get your opinion on a film from me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can share my opinion, but don't make it your opinion if you yeah, haven't yeah. actually seen Have it, right? Own. So go and watch it. Um, but when I did a little deep diving for the sake of my video talking about it, because I said design-wise, you're right, for those versed enough in moko, like we mentioned earlier in the corridor today, moko looks like moko. You know, mm. you can see all sorts of different tattoo styles, and when you see moko, you go, "Yeah, that is moko." Yeah. When you watch the Avatar movie, you go, "Oh yeah." Face tattoo design for aliens, inspired by moko, but it doesn't look like moko. It yeah. doesn't. For those who are familiar, there, I know there's a lot of, you know, I get lots of questions just the minute there's a, a face tattoo that isn't lettering <laughs> everyone goes that's gotta be moko right and you go no you know like yeah, bro. we know that difference and so when i saw the design itself i went oh yeah you know they've done enough to make it different and out there but then i did some more deep diving into the background behind it and and it's the simple things i don't even mention it in the movies you know so mm. the average viewer wouldn't realize the effort i guess that went behind it but mm. I, I found the sorts of things that in the canon or in the lore of the films what they were supposed to represent for them and that mm -hmm. for me i saw what it meant to it connects them to their land their people you know these yep. things uh, instead of what i normally call the usual misunderstanding when it comes to things like moko is mm -hmm. the warrior right every mm -hmm. other example bad example of moko misrepresentation is it's all about being the best warrior the strong guy you know what i mean yeah um and being so, loud and boisterous that's right you know um or being the chief again mm. that, that sort of stuff mm. um and so when i saw that the reasoning behind their made up designs was more in line with the real sort of understanding of moko i went oh that's new you know you yeah, never yeah. see that you never every other example i ever talk about online it's all about that same stuff about being a fearsome warrior tough guy yeah. you know all these things and you go what, it, was, it was interesting seeing it done differently you know and some people which is fair enough but you know for lots of people it doesn't matter you know um it's a rich non-maori person very rich i should say non-maori person who's made these films yeah. they don't care you know it's appropriation as far as you're concerned for, yeah forever so um but for me, just de delving into a little bit deeper, I thought, ah, oh, you know, it's interesting that concept of understanding. Yeah, being, bro, yeah. Uh, being a point of difference, you know, because he's not just inspired by, he almost clearly has more of an understanding too. Mm. And then changing it enough that it's yep. not exactly the same. You yeah. Know? So, well, that's for the line of inspiration, I should yeah. say as well. Yeah, know, bro. And I agree. Other... And, um, you know, all of those, like our own people out there who, don't agree that's all good you're allowed to you're allowed yeah. to not agree that's you're right allowed to think that it shouldn't be done um but yeah just for for you and myself yeah i i think it's all right yeah. how it's been done and the approach and all of that yeah um so <clears throat> how does or has moko evolved with either the revitalization of moko modern tools things like color uh, as an artist how do you um if you do push the boundaries when it comes to design uh you know in when it comes to moko and things like that yeah yeah um yeah it's definitely changed heaps there've been um obviously there was the renaissance of moko um when was it would have been probably the 80s yeah, I want to say the 80s slash 90s, um, you know, when gangs were 
getting moko on their face and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, and then it's coming to like today. Like I felt like there was another wave in probably like the early two thousands. And then now I feel like there was another wave, like when social media came out or when social media started becoming more prevalent. Um, for me, bro, like I take inspiration from all over the place and I have a lot of creative interests. Yeah. Um, like my approach to moko, like clean or trying to make it as clean and sort of easy to read as I can. That comes from studying art and, um, Actually, one core concept that I've learned that has sort of trickled down into my creative endeavors has been contrast. And I learned this from a tattoo artist named Jeff Gogwe. He's an American dude. He's been top tier, top tier. It's like at one point, that's he's the person that I was like had at the top of the mind every day. Um, And there was this lesson he gave in this book that he made for a seminar he did, which is around contrast. And if I were to break contrast down in a nutshell, it's um, when you place opposing elements next to each other and they make each other more powerful. So an example is black and white. Black next to white looks darker than it does if it was next to gray, for example. And white looks lighter next to black. If it was next to gray, it wouldn't look as white, you know. And then that goes through anything, through texture, through subject matter. So for me and moko, Simplicity and complexity is probably the main things that I, I juggle in dance. So having the majority of moko or my approach to moko being simple and clean makes the complex areas stand out more, makes them grab your attention more. But if the whole thing was just complex, it would be like, mm-hmm. hmm, I don't know where to look. I don't yeah. know where to start. If the whole thing was just simple, it's like, oh, very clean, simple, but next you know there's nothing that wants to grab my attention yeah. so that dance bro so for me um yeah being inspired by things outside of moko and i may be wrong maybe that's a, a concept that has always been in moko but um for me personally i got that concept from outside of moko right and then i brought it inside to moko and into moko and now one of my probably one of the things that i appreciate most is um what I said earlier, tasteful simplicity. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like um, you think about Picasso. Like Picasso could do realism and all that, <clears throat> but he, it took him through his journey of art to go into realism and all of this to come back to like the stuff that looks like anyone could draw. Yep. You know, but it's it's a more um, experienced um decisive mind that has made that piece of artwork that looks like anyone can do it you know and i you have a more appreciation for stuff like that now yeah no and it's definitely one of the things that drew me to your style when i approached you was like it it is it's just clear you can look Mm. at that on a webcam and you can read it yeah yeah see everything there and a really great example of that in more recent time is of course since joining the band and playing on all these shows all around the world is the photography that mm. comes from the photographers that are shooting the show, you know, and how readable they are for people who are standing way, way back in the distance in a crowd, you know, and they can see that on my arms when I'm playing on stage and it's clear, you know, it's yeah, readable bro. from a distance and it's simple and deceptively simple because <laughs> you're right you know you go and you try and make these lines as um parallel as they are and we you know <laughs> and as someone who spends time drawing like a uh, toy maori you know not not mm. moko, uh, but i know how hard it is to keep that keep them exactly parallel you know and so mm. it's definitely one of the i would say one of the standout features of your mm. of your art Thank style you, bro. and you, you you touched on an important point too that was something that was important to me as well was having moko that you can appreciate from afar and then you can get closer and be like, whoa, there's all this other stuff that I didn't know was there, you know, as opposed to being from far away and being like, far out, what's that? Yeah. Getting close. <laughs> oh, it's this. Uh, yeah. Right. You know, you want to be like, whoa, I know what that is from this far and get close and be like, whoa, there's whoa, this as well. There's the details. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
uh, you know, because from afar on the photos, it can look like it's just black sometimes. Yeah, and then yeah. you go and you go, oh, wait, it's all lines. You know, people yeah. go, oh, heck. And so exactly those little bro. moments, eh? Hey? Well, <laughs> that's us. Uh, so um, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down and have a court it all today. You're the very first, the very first on this series. So I'm, uh, thank you very much for that. And I'm hoping uh, I can get a few more people to come on. I know I have a couple more lined up, so I'm mm. excited uh, for well, both you, everyone who who comes in and has a chat to get a little bit more coverage and their and their word out there. Um, is there anything else you would like to add, and maybe some advice for Māori who are thinking about getting moko? Cool. Uh, first off, thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> good. I forget good. how how awesome. um, delicious it is to have like good thoughtful kōrero, you know. And this has been um it's been one of those conversations. So thank you, bro. And thank you. Um, and my first time as the interviewer. <laughs> bro, you did great. Natural. Just as natural as you are, Bloom, and being on the other side of the <laughs> um and big mihi to your audience as well. Um Yeah, and keep keep doing what you're doing, bro. I I, I can hear you and I see see what it is you're you're trying to do and it's choice, bro. Probably the thank best you. thing one of the best things I can see about you is um not being attached to to anything and not being attached to like any opinions just being like a, a student of of whatever world you decide to to walk among um which is i think admirable you know for for anyone thanks because that way you become um someone who can take on knowledge and experience and stuff because you're not attached to what you came into it with it's like oh i'm wrong cool change my mind <laughs> you know that's a good thing that's a good yeah thing. Um, advice to, to Māori wanting to receive moko. Um Find out why you want to get it. doesn't have to be a deep, deep meaningful thing. It can be something very simple as signifying that you're Māori. That's all good. Um, and then find the right artist. I encourage either of you to find the right artist um, wherever they are, however much they cost. Um, and be respectful of, of them and their time and their expertise. Awesome. And now to wrap it up, plug. I mean, I'll be tagging you and everything anyway, but let them know, let people know where to find you. And of course, from a business perspective, what is the way that you like to be contacted uh, in mm. terms of, you know, if people wish to get moko done by you or kirituhi, are you a social media guy? Are you an email guy? Let mm. them know. Cool. Perfect. Uh, you can find me pretty much on every social media, uh, Te Haunui Art, T-E-H-A-U-N-U-I, Art, A-R-T. Um, I prefer to be contacted if, if it's for moko or kirituhi through my email, which is info at tehonuiart.com. Um, yeah, I prefer that. Otherwise, just send me a message on whatever social media you use. Uh, and I've made it a thing actually for myself because I've been pretty terrible with messaging, but it's one of my tasks to get back to messages every single day. Um, so at the very latest, I'll get back to you within 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. 